Uh, next talk is uh, by Won San Chen. And the title is uh, Time Bearing High Energy Emission from Gamma Ray Binaries. Please. OK, so uh, we'll talk about uh, the time varying uh, high energy emission from the uh, gamma ray binary. So uh, the gamma ray binary uh, usually um, consists of the uh, massive OB star and a compact star. The orbital are usually highly elliptical and with the orbit uh, ranging from 3.9 days to 50 years. The gamma ray luminosity dominate the emission spectrums. The X-ray and the TV are mainly produced by the interaction between the stars, and the flux vary with the orbital phase. From the binary population synthesis, we believe that that would be uh, about a 30 of a such system in the Milky Way. And currently, we have discovered seven such systems, including one in the March Lagrangian cloud, and the one with a very long orbital phase, about 50 years. So here is the one discovered in the Large Magellanic Cloud uh, by Fermilab. And uh, the orbital period is about 10.3 uh, days. The X-ray uh, counterpart is discovered by SWIFT. And the uh, companion star is an O star or a B star. It's not uh, uh, confirmed yet. The compact star prefer to be a neutron star by the uh, mass functions. The, uh, we can see that the, all the X-ray, GV, and TV uh, have a pit, but their pit position are not the same. This is the uh, um, PSR J2032. And this gamma ray binary have a longest orbital period, uh, about 50 years. And again, uh, uh, it consists of a, a Fermi gamma ray pulsar with the period uh, equal to uh, 143.2 milliseconds. And the companion star is the B star. The periastron uh, is, uh, take, uh, took place in the last November 12th. The X-ray show rapid variations around the uh, periastron uh, positions. And the, uh, but on the other hand, if we look at the GV gamma ray, we don't see some obvious uh, uh, increase. Uh, in the TV range, detected by very text and metrics, show rapid increase in, uh, since the last uh, middle of uh, September. This is the uh, uh, 1GFL uh, J1018. Again, this is detected by the Fermilab, and the parts will be contain a uh, pulsar plus an O star. The orbital period is around 16.6 days, but the other uh, orbital parameter is not that clear. And we can see that uh, the TEV, the GEV, and the uh, X-ray, they are p uh, their pit position uh, quite closely correlated. This is the uh, LSI uh, 61 and detected by a metric at Veritex. Again, the pulsar B contain a pulsar plus a BE staff. The orbital period is about 26.5 days. The high energy emissions show one pit in uh, X-ray, GV, and TV again but the pit position are not the same. Uh, in addition, that, uh, the, a super orbital modulation about 4.4 years, this uh, super orbital modulation seems to be related to the salary modulations. The hex uh, J0632 uh, uh, first was first discovered by hex. So the name is uh, begin with hex. The compact companion, the nature is not known. It could be a, uh, either a black hole or a neutron star. And the companion star is a BE star. The mass function suggests that the mass of the uh, compact star, the mass is ranging from 1.3 to 
to 7.1 solar mass. So it still could be a neutron star. The orbital period is about a year. And both the X-ray and TV has orbital modulations uh, showing in here, showing in here, OK? The GEV is uh, finally confirmed uh, from the uh, lag data by Lee. Um, and they show that the, um, in the orbital phase between 0 and 0.5, the emissions, the GEV emission is stronger. It seems that at least quite consistent with the uh, X-ray and the TEV observation as well. <coughs> Oops. Okay. So, um, how do we? Uh, uh, what what kind of the uh, mechanism would produce uh, such a, a multi-wavelength uh, uh, emissions from this uh, gamma ray binary? So we consider that if the compact star is really a pulsar, then we can think of uh, the first components would, the, would be the magnetospheric emissions, similar to all other uh, Fermi gamma ray pulsar. There would be a, a spin modulated uh, gamma, uh, GeV gamma ray component coming out from the uh, outer magnetospheric gaps. And, but this component should not have any orbital modulations. And the spectrum of this component would be described by a power law with the exponential cutoff. And the characteristic cutoff energy will run a, G, a few GeVs. And in fact, the uh, PSR J2032 uh, uh, plus uh, 4127 uh, has been detected with this component. Now, if the companion, uh, if the compact companion is indeed a pulsar, then the pulsar wind and the stellar wind will collide and form a termination shock. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, the first, uh, uh, the, if the com uh, compact star is a pulsar, it will emit a nearly monoenergetic uh, pulsar wind. And the Lorentz factor is typically 10 to the 4th. We can imagine that when the pulsar moving toward the su superior conjunction uh, phase, then the uh, relativistic electron is propagating toward the Earth. But at the same time, it will hit the soft photon from the companion star. And it will be inverse Compton boost the low energy photon to the GeV energy range. So we will expect that around the superior conjunction, that would be an enhancement of the GME emissions. So this would be orbitally modulated. And the peak would be around the superior conjunctions. So the next orbital modulated component is produced by the fact that if the, the pulsar wind and the stellar wind can collide to form a termination shock, the electron in the short regions can be accelerated to the relativistic energies. Such relativistic uh, uh, electrons can radiate X-ray through the uh, single charge uh, radiations. And uh, by interacting with the soft photon uh, from the companion star, it will also produce the TV uh, emissions through the inverse Compton process. And roughly speaking, we can divide the emission region into uh, two. One is uh, uh, apex shock apex regions, where the emissions should be isotropic. But however, once the pulsar enter the uh, circumstellar disk of the B star, the shock radius would be rapidly changing. So therefore, the intensities emitting from this region could also be rapidly uh, changed. And we can see this phenomena in the case of a PSR a B1259-63. And another uh, shock emission region is the outflow regions. And one can imagine that if the line of sight happens, 
very close to the alpha region in particular, when we uh, uh, in, our, uh, in the inferior conjunction, then because of the Doppler boosting effects, then the radiation from the alpha region will be enhanced. And such enhancement has been observed in the L LS5039 and PSRJ2032 uh, plus uh, 4127s. So, with all these uh, three uh, mechanisms, that uh, um, uh, we, we, uh, we, we could try to understand the uh, radiations uh, from this uh, gamma ray binary. So we uh, first take the uh, LS5039 as an uh, example. Now this system actually is the uh, gamma ray binary with a, a shortest orbital phase with an uh, orbital period with a 3.9 days, and the companion star is an O star. Now here we are putting the, um, on the left panel, we are putting the uh, photon light curve with energy higher than uh, 200 uh, million electron volts. From this, we can clearly see that the light curve is modulating uh, uh, over the orbital period. But on the other hand, we can select the photon energy uh, larger than um, uh, uh, 1 GeV, which is shown on the right panel. Then we can see the modulation over the orb orbital phase is uh, greatly reduced. So we speculate that in the energy range between 200 million electron volts and uh, 10 GeV could possibly contain uh, two components. And one component is steady. Like for the, for, for the photon energy above 1 GeV, the emission is steady uh, against the orbital uh, phase. But for the photon with energy below 1 GeV, that may have a component uh, uh, modulating with the orbital phase. Now, this is the uh, uh, multi-wavelength uh, spectrums of the uh, of this system, ranging from uh, 10 keV to uh, 10 TeVs. So, as we mentioned, that the X-ray from the gamma ray binary and the TeV are most likely from the shock regions, from the shock regions. Through the synchrotron radiation, which is produced the emission in X-ray, and the TeV is produced through the inverse Compton scattering. But then, what would be the cause for the photon in the energy range of the Fermi? Then, as we just uh, speculate by uh, using the um, light curve as our uh, give us some hints. We suggest that there might be uh, one component which is steady, which is, would be uh, likely from the magnetospheric emissions from the pulsar uh, uh, emitted inside the light cylinder. Then there's another component due to the inverse Compton scattering between the soft photon from the star and the cold pulsar wind. Okay. So let's see how does it works. Uh, perhaps that uh, before that I should mention, in this model we need to uh, introduce some parameter, because uh, uh, in particular for this source, the pulsar is not observed. We assume the compact uh, star is a pulsar, so we need to assume the spin down powers, and then we need to uh, assume the how. Uh, another parameter called magnetization parameter, which is uh, determine how much spin down power will go to the uh, particle. Because we know that uh, near the uh, pulsar, most of the energy would be in EM wave, but far away from the pulsar, then 
the spin down power will gradually transform them from the EM wave to the kinetic energy of the particle. So we need to describe how the magnetization parameter evolves. And we uh, use a simple power law to describe the evolution of the magnetization parameter uh, proportional to 1 over r. And then we also need to know uh, what is the incarnation angle, because the incarnation angle tells us that what would be the characteristic distance between the inverse Compton scattering regime to the star so that the solved photon density would be determined. Okay, So uh, with all those uh, input parameters, then we can start to compare the uh, model calculations with the uh, observed data. Now here we first consider in the Fermi uh, uh, first consider the Fermi data because the Fermi data is uh, open uh, for everybody to use. Then we can we divide the um, the photon into three sectors over the orbital phase. The first sector includes the inferior conjunctions, and the second sectors in, include the superior conjunctions. And the third one would be the remaining. So each of these two sectors will roughly contain the, um, uh, the similar amount of photons. On the, um, on the top left panels, uh, which is so the, uh, in the uh, yellow regions, and the blue uh, and the purple ones would be the uh, inferior conjunction section and the red one will be the um, superior conjunction sections. Now, this uh, different color, uh, the, the, the lines with a different color uh, sense the following. The light green line represent the magnetospheric emissions. And the deep blue lines represent the uh, inverse Compton component between the uh, stellar photon and the pulsar wind. And the light blue line represents the uh, contribution from the shock. Now, from this three uh, di uh, diagram, we can see that the magneto uh, magnetospheric emissions is always dominated in the energy range between 1 GeV to 10 GeV. The inverse Compton uh, component in the short regions is always dominated in the region larger than uh, a ten G, higher than 10 GeV. So we can see that this blue line is always higher than the other two components above a 10 GeV. And the inverse Compton uh, component of the pulsar wind is mainly contributed to the energy less than 1 GeV. So in the lower uh, gamma ray uh, range, it is the inverse Compton uh, pulses between the soft photon of the star and the pulsar wind which is contribute. Now, the bottom right panels actually divide the data into a smaller phase, uh, orbital phase spins by fitting the data with a simple power law. So the cross is representing the, uh, the data. And the solid line is, rep is the model calculated data and fit with a simple power law. So we can see that, roughly speaking, the, um, the features of the observed, uh, observed uh, data and compared with the, uh, the uh, theoretical uh, curve would uh, uh, roughly uh, uh, consistent with each other. Now, what about the X-ray light curve? Now, uh, from this um, diagram, we can see that uh, the X-ray data showing a dip around the superior conjunctions, but a peak around the inferior conjunctions. Theoretically, we can first calculate the X-ray emission from the shock, but first without considering the Doppler boosting effect, so which is shown in the uh, blue dash line, which is, doesn't show uh, uh, a lot of the orbital modulation. 
But however, if we include the uh, Doppler effect into the um, uh, calculation, then it would uh, be shown in this uh, red line. And the dip in the superior conjunction can be understood as follow, because in the superior conjunction, the outflow is in the opposite directions of the observer right there. And on the other hand, in the inferior conjunctions, the outflow is moving toward the observer. Therefore, one is the more or less negative Doppler boosting effect. The other one is a positive Doppler boosting effect, which, so that it causes a, a minimum and maximum in these two particular uh, orbital phase. Now, what about the light curve in TV? So here is uh, some data uh, of the light curve in the TV, which is shown uh, two, uh, two dips. One is in the uh, superior conjunction. The other one is in inferior conjunctions. Now, we can understand uh, these two dips as following. In the superior conjunction, the stellar soft photon will hit the uh, relativistic electron in the short regions and boost it to the TeV. But however, this TeV photon will run into the same ambient soft photon. And the ambient soft photon can turn the TeV photon into electron positron pair. So the pair creations process can suppress the TeV photon in the superior conjunctions. On the other hand, in the near the inferior conjunctions, the, um, the, uh, the collision between the stellar photon and the um, relativistic electron in order, after the collision, in order to propagate to work the observer, the collision angle will be small. Then the solar photon have to find some higher energy electron to do the inverse Compton sketch in order to produce the photon in the same energy range. But higher energy photon, uh, higher energy electron are less. So that reduced the uh, inverse Compton uh, efficiency. OK, so next we consider another example, the uh, PSR uh, B1259 minus 63. This is a system consists of a known radio pulsar with the spin period about 40, equal to 47.76 milliseconds. And the companion star is a BE star with a, a circumstellar disk. And in fact, the disk location is quite close to the inferior conjunction, not exactly, but close, to the inferior conjunction and the superior conjunction. The line of sight is in this direction. And this showing the, uh, X, um, the X-ray, uh, a radio X-ray, uh, GV and TV light curve. The two uh, red vertical lines indicate the positions of the uh, this of the uh, of the circumstellar disk. And we can see that both in the radio X-ray and TV, the peak are quite correlated. In fact, it's very near the locations of the uh, circumstellar disk. But on the other hand, the GV is away. So we will come back to the GV later. Now, it has already been proposed by uh, many other groups that the enhancement in the X-ray and TV is due to the pulsar uh, disk interactions. So let's see how this uh, uh, pulsar disk interactions can uh, enhance the X-ray and uh, TeV emissions. Okay, so first we need to calculate the shock radius. The shock rate, oops, doesn't count. Uh, does, it, it should be a, it should be a vector, vector sign. Okay, so so this is the uh, vector of the uh, uh, wind of the of the stellar wind. This is the vector of the uh, pulsar. Okay. All right, so the shock radius is determined by the uh, balance between the pulsar wind, uh, pulsar wind pressure 
and the ramp pressure of the stellar winds. So we can see that when the pulsar enter the uh, 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 stellar disk, the density is rapidly increased. So the short radius is rapidly decreased. On the other hand, the magnetic field is inverse proportional to the shock radius. Of course, it's also related to the shock, the magnetization parameter. But since the um, uh, variation when the enter the disk is the very the distance variation is very little, so that the uh, the magnetization parameter is more or less like a constant. So the most important factor is one of uh, uh, Rs. So once the short radius is rapidly decreased, then the magnetic field will rapidly increase uh, in the um, in the disk regions, such that the enhancement of the magnetic field will enhance the single charge radiation efficiency. Now, this is the model calculation for the uh, X-ray light curve. First, the dotted line represents the predicted X-ray light curve without the disk. So the pit position should, would be around the periastron positions. But once we add the disk there, there would be a tool. Uh, that this is uh, represented by the long dash line. That would be two uh, more or less symmetric uh, double peak in the X-ray light curve. But however, the data show a symmetric pit. The reason uh, for that is, uh, again, is due to the double boosting effects. This one is uh, in the, um, in the uh, superior conjunction, which is have a negative double boosting effect. This one is near the inferior conjunction, so the double boosting effect is positive. So, so once we take into account the uh, double boosting effect, the asymmetric X-ray light curve uh, would be produced. But however, one would notice that outside the disk, there's still a lot of X-ray emissions. Why? Well, we may get some hints from the radio observations. This is a radio observation on 2000 uh, uh, periastron passage of, of the systems. One can also notice that around the disk positions, there's a two double peak in radio. But then after the pulsar leaving the disk, the radio intensity does not fall off rapidly. It falls off slowly. So uh, corners at all, they explain such a phenomena by the fact that the radio emission is resulting from a formation of the synchrotron bubble created in the disk passage. And the intensity fall off is due to the adiabatic expansion of the bubble. And the expansion speed is about 12 kilometers per, sec uh, per hour. And in fact, this expansion velocity is really close to the sound speed of the this material. So one can imagine that when the pulsar enters the disk and the short radius is get complex, when the pulsar leaves the disk, but the material is still piling up in front of the uh, uh, pulsar. And the material cannot be immediately go away. They need to disperse more or less with the sound speeds. So if we take into account this expanding speed, and similar to that uh, observed in the radio uh, light curve, then we will find that the X-ray light curve uh, can be fit very well, namely the, expans uh, the expansion of the uh, shock radius is not immediately decrease, uh, increase after leaving the disk. It actually need to when the material power in front of it need gradually remove away. Okay. Now next, let's consider the TV emission uh, from this system. The TV emission has to be have have to have some uh, ambient photon in order to produce a, uh, to in order the inverse Compton scattering to produce the TV. 
Then uh, in the case of the LS5039, the only one saw photon source is the star. But in this case, in this case, the not only the star can produce the saw photon, but also the uh, circumstellar disk itself also can also produce the saw photon. And furthermore, we will suggest that, in fact, when the pulsar uh, causing the disk, after that, a transient accretion disk will be formed around the pulsar. So that actually will have uh, three different uh, soft photon source in this system. OK, so this is the uh, 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 cal uh, model calculation for the TV light curve. Before the pulsar entered the disk, the only uh, a soft photon is come from the B star. But once the pulsar entered the disk, the this photon will dominate as a soft photon source. And so that, so that the TV uh, has a pit in the, in the disk. And similarly, uh, in other side, in other side, um, then after leaving the disk, uh, we will show you later that the accretion disk actually uh, will form after leaving the disk. So the contribution from the transient accretion disk will emerge. And therefore, the, uh, the, the uh, TV light curve will, can get extended uh, beyond the, uh, the disk. OK, now let's come back to the, um, to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Fermi data uh, energy range. Now, we can see that the pit um, for two periastron passage, one in the 2010s, the other in the 2014s, uh, both uh, after the periastron passage, the GV will have a, a, a flare, will have a flare, okay? But the peak positions of the GV flare is not the same as the X-ray and TV, okay? So, in fact, the, uh, the TV, uh, the GV uh, fairing is around here, around here, outside of this. So we have a good reason to believe that uh, the, the, uh, the uh, GV emissions may not relate to the shock, OK? So we propose, oh, OK, this is showing more uh, data um, for the, uh, uh, the pa uh, periodic uh, passage for this uh, system. And um, we, uh, during the uh, um, firm emissions, it covers three periodic uh, passage of this source. Now here is in, indicate that the in every the dash vertical wet dash vertical line indicate the position of the periodic passage. So and in every time when the uh, pulsar uh, uh, pass the uh, periodic then there's a GV flare will occur. All right. So but this one uh, we only analyze the data. Uh, until uh, 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 November 21st. So actually, the, the, uh, the fair continues. But nevertheless, we notice that the peak positions of this GEV fair is always occur around 30 to 60 days after the periastron, which is uh, beyond the disk, the stellar disk. And the duration of this uh, uh, a uh, flare is uh, roughly about 100 days. We could use a shorter, we could use a shorter time beam to analyze the data. And we can see that the location of the, uh, of the stellar disk is right there. This uh, one is uh, before the periastron, one is after the periastron. And the GV peak is occurred after the, uh, the stellar disk. Okay, 
Oops. Yes. And, and we can. Oops. Ah. Yes. Uh, we can further subdivide the photon energy into two groups. One is uh, um, 100 MeV to 1 GeV. The other is uh, 1 GeV to 10 GeV. Now, from this uh, a two light curve, we can see that the GeV fairing after the periostron mainly contributed in the lower energy band, not in the high energy. Okay. So here is our uh, a proposal for uh, explaining the uh, GeV flare. We argue that whenever the pulsar passing through the stellar disk, it would grab some material from the disk by the gravitational attractions. And the, disk, uh, the, the material grabbed by the, uh, uh, the pulsar will eventually form a accretion disk around the pulsar. But however, the time, it, there would be, it, it takes some time for the uh, gravitation capture matter to form the accretion disk. And typically, it would be the viscous times. It would be viscous times. And so that the disk will not immediately form in the stellar disk. In fact, it's outside. Now, but we need to be careful. Although, in principle, the gravity of the neutron star can capture the matter. But however, one can see that if they capture a bond hoyt capture radius is smaller than the short radius, then the stellar wind matter will be blocked by the shock fronts and cannot be channeled onto the neutron star. Okay? So we have to calculate whether the bond hoyt radius is larger or smaller than the shock radius. Here is uh, we used the um, um, the uh, known information about the disk and the uh, relative motions of the uh, pulsar around the uh, periastrons, and we can calculate the uh, shock radius. Uh, this is a shock radius, and the uh, uh, dash line here is the uh, bond uh, capture radius. Now remember that. Uh, Outside of this, the, uh, the capture radius is more or less um, constant. And under the disk, the de uh, density becomes higher, so the uh, capture radius change. So only in the first passage, the shock radius is less than the capture radius. In the second passage right there, it even though we use a um, uh, n equal to three, uh, the which is represent the density profile of the disk or, or of the disk, yes, then it is marginal. This two radius is marginal, so we are not so sure whether there's a mass transfer in the second passage, but we are quite sure that the uh, there would be mass transfer in the first passage. All right. OK, now, then in addition to the mass transfer, whether it can occur or not, we also need to be careful about how the matter accreted. Now, if the matter, if the matter comes in without sufficient angular momentum, it could directly fall into uh, the neutron star and shut down all the pulsar activity. In that case, nothing interesting will happen. So we would like to form uh, accretion disk around the pulsar. So we need to calculate what is the initial radius of the accretion disk. And the initial radius of the accretion disk is determined by the angular momentum of the transfer material. And the angular momentum of the transfer material is determined by the density and velocity gradient of the circumstellar disk. Okay, so we use the uh, known parameter of uh, the uh, PSR. Uh, well, actually, the known parameter of the 
BE star uh, uh, in the um, in the in this gamma binary systems, and we obtain that that the initial uh, 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 radius of the this actually is a larger than the light cylinder uh, radius, larger than the light cylinder radius, and then they first form a more or less like a torus in this uh, in initial uh, radius out circle, and then gradually moving in with the vis viscous time scale. And that time scale is typically a few 10 days. OK, here is the picture uh, 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 for the uh, GeV uh, fairing. So we are saying that the mass will be captured by the neutron star during the passage, in particular in the first passage. And the capture matter will spiral in to form a accretion disk surround the neutron star, which is typically take a few ten days. And when the, when the disk is um, gradually moving in, it would convert the gravitational uh, energy into the part of the gravitational energy would be converted uh, to the, to the uh, uh, thermal radiation in this. So actually, we adopt a uh, standard disk model. Okay, so here the um, the figure one showing the temperature evolutions of the accretion disk. Oops. Okay. So, so uh, when the disk gradually moving in, the temperature of the disk increase, but once it arrives the alpha radius, it will be stopped by the magnetic field of the pulsar. And then uh, it stops there. If there's no more matter per Y, because after the pulsar leaving the disk, there's no more matter uh, per Y, the disk accretion rate will drop. We choose a power law to describe the drop. And in fact, we've used uh, three different uh, power law decay. One is the, uh, the uh, opacity is dominated by the electron scatter. Oh, I, uh, OK, I, I, that's a two more slide. Okay. So the uh, temperature will drop in a power law. So once the disk is there, this, uh, this soft photon will inverse Compton scatter with the uh, uh, relativistic electron to produce a GeV photons. And since the, uh, the, the, uh, the disk is a uh, uh, temperature is very with time, so the GeV spectrum is also very with time. So we compare the light curve uh, of the observed data and the model light curve with, uh, uh, with the, uh, in this system, and also just compare the time average spectrum of the systems. And if we wanted to see how the temperature, uh, how the spectrum evolve with time, so we split the, um, the data into the pit region and the tail region, and then we can see that the model temper uh, time dependent spectrum and uh, the data still agree uh, pretty well. So this is a summary. Then we believe that the spin modulated components should come from the magnetosphere. The orbital modulated X-ray and TV likely come from the short regions through the in, uh, single charge and inverse Compton scattering respectively. The GV flare could be produced between the inverse Compton of the pulsar wind and the disk photons. And we predicted that the, in the LS 5039, there should be a pulsar, but which is remain to be confirmed. And other two B, B star gamma ray binary, like, uh, like uh, J0632 and uh, J2032, uh, the orbital modulation in the GV has not yet been confirmed, so we need more study. And in fact, well, we choose uh, two very simple um, gamma ray binary to model, and in fact, actually, uh, you, uh, if you wanted to model the other, it's become more difficult. Thank you.